Carol Rowe wanted to stay in Braddock's house because there was always great crack there. And part of the reason they had great crack was that some of the houses would only take men and some of the houses would only take women, but Coit take, took both men and women, so there was always that free song over the pond in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and on top of that, there was always sing songs and cards and dancing, so there was always great fun of the house and everyone wanted to stay there. Now, Coit herself was the ugliest little woman you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> She was tiny, she was a hunchback, she had bottle end glasses, she had that, you know that curly hair that sort of goes up like that? But she was the kindliest soul on the planet. And not only that, but she was known in four counties as the best matchmaker around. People always said about Coit that when she got a couple together, they stuck. <laughs> but Coit's secret in making the matches was that she got to know the people. And she didn't just you know, fix people up because you know, they were the right age or they were from the right place, but she got to know their personalities. So when this young woman, whose name was Kathleen, was staying down in Carabao, Coit got to know her over the fortnight. And over the fortnight, she learned that, Co that Kathleen was looking for a fella. So one day she came to her and she said, I have the fella for you. But you have to come with me to the station, he's arriving down here tonight on the train. So off they set in the Assen cart down to the train station and they arrived in time to see the train come in and all the people got off the train and next thing three fellas came up to Coit and Coit introduced them as uh, Willie and Frank and Sean and when they got to Sean she went, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> to so Kathleen had a look and she, her first thought was, he's too small. <laughs> and when the fellas were putting their bags up on the ass and cart, Coit turned to Kathleen and said, well, what do you think? And she said, he's too small. And Coit said, don't be stupid, for goodness sake. And then Kathleen said, the other problem is he's far too good looking. He'll have a great sniff about himself. He'll think he's God's gift. <laughs> so Coit said, well, at least give him a chance. So Kathleen promised to give him a chance, but she knew in her own head she was already setting up all the hoops that he was going to have to jump through before she'd even consider going out with them. So anyway, they went back to the house and over the next couple of weeks, it turned out that Sean took a great fancy to Kathleen. And he was always trying to get her by herself. And any time she and her friends were going, he'd always join in. And he was always trying to get her to go off in, on picnics and every time he asked her to go out somewhere, she always brought her friends along, which was a little frustrating, I believe. However, over the, the, the next couple of weeks, he jumped through enough hoops that Kathleen was prepared to go out with them again when they got back to Dublin. So that was grand. They got back to Dublin. They started seeing one another regularly. She met his family. They thought she was lovely. He met her family. They thought he was lovely. And every Sunday, he used to arrive up to her house in the, on Sunday afternoon and they'd go out, maybe cycle out to Holt or go to the Botanic Gardens and then they'd come back to the house, to her house, and they'd play cards and sing songs. That was their idea of a hot date. <laughs> a very hot date at the time. <laughs> so, after a while, Sean decided that it was time to pop the question. And he knew perfectly well that it was going to be a long engagement because both of them were the sole support of their families and they were going to have to wait until a younger sibling was earning money. But they were prepared to do that. So off he went down to um, Slater's in Johnson's Court. And Slater's turned out to be a friend of a friend, so he got a great deal on the ring and he got a much better ring than he normally would have been able to afford. And off he set the next Sunday with the ring in his pocket and his hopes very high and he landed to the door and Kathleen's mother answered the door. As always, she, this was what always happened. She opened the door and she said, Oh, Sean, she doesn't want to see you anymore. <laughs> so he, <laughs> he was, of course, entirely taken. I said, well, what, 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 why, what, what's wrong? And the, the, the mother said, well, I don't know. Uh, she just said she doesn't want to see you anymore. But wait, can, can I talk to her? No, she doesn't want to talk to you. What do you mean? What, 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 what? And she just stonewalled every question. 
So he decided on something going on here, and he decided he'd go home and he'd write to her. So he wrote to her. Meanwhile, Kathleen was up in the room. She had a principle that she never answered the door to Sean because it, it looked like she was too eager and she didn't want to look too eager. So she always arranged that her mother answered answer the door and then called her and then she went down. So she was upstairs waiting. She heard the, the, the door go and she was listening and then she heard the door close and she said to her mother, well, was that Sean? And the mother said, no, no, that was Mrs. Byrne next door. She's just looking for the dog. So she waited and he didn't turn up. And of course she was devastated. He went home and he wrote her a letter and he posted it. And at the time letters would arrive, like you post, the, post them in the morning, they arrive in the afternoon. And he got no answer. And he kept writing, he wrote every single day and he got no answer. And after about three months he, he stopped writing every day, he just started writing once a week. And he kept writing once a week for an entire year and he never got any answer. So his, his friends were talking to him and saying, well, why don't you just meet her or something? And he was saying, well, I've written to her. She has never answered. What's the point? Clearly she doesn't want to see me. And her friends were saying to her, why don't you sort of hook up with them? And she was saying, he was the one who didn't turn up. Uh, so I'm not going to take the first step. It's up to him. And that went on and on and on for 10 years. And during that time, she'd hear, oh, uh, we saw Sean with so-and-so and so-and-so. And he'd hear, oh, we saw Kathleen with so-and-so and so-and-so. And both of them went out with people, but never more than once. And after 10 years, Coit Brannock was up in Dublin one time, and she heard the whole thing. She wanted to know what was going on with Sean and Kathleen. And she said, right, I want to do something about this. So she persuaded Kathleen to come down to Carrow Road the following, I don't know, Easter summer. And she also persuaded Sean quite separately. <laughs> so Kathleen came down first and Coyd said, I have a fella I want you to meet. He's coming down on the train tonight. And off they went on the acid cart. And who was there? Only Sean. So Coyd said, now, you two are to get into the back of the cart and I'm not letting you into my house until you've sorted it out, whatever it is. So by the time they got back to her house in Carraro, they had discovered what had happened, that something had happened. So the two of them were absolutely furious with Kathleen's mother. And as soon as they got back to Dublin, they confronted her. And she admitted then that she'd taken all the letters and burnt them. She'd made sure to get to the post first thing in the morning and she'd burnt all the letters. And they were, but why? Like, what did you do that for? And her explanation was, but Kathleen, you've a fine, permanent and pensionable job. What would you need a man for? For their only trouble. <laughs> <laughs> this woman had married when she was 17 and she had 12 children, so maybe. <laughs> she was also married to a drunk, so, you know. She maybe had a point. But anyway, after that, they got engaged, they got married, and they lived happily ever after. And the reason I know that they lived happily ever after was they were my parents. Oh.